All right, it looks like it's about time. If you want to clear back your plates, make a way for your Bible, your notebook. We will continue our journey here through chapter 3. So again, as always, we are studying Nehemiah, big calling, bigger God, and looking at how Nehemiah used wisdom and courage in order to accomplish great things for the Lord, and then that have that speak to us on how we can then, in turn, accomplish the things that God lays out before us. We are in the middle of chapter 3, where we are looking at kind of the who's who of who is rebuilding the wall. And so in chapters 1 and 2, we've prepared the way, we've tilled up the soil, we've made the plans. Now we're rebuilding the wall. And chapter 3 gives us a full circuit uh, of who is rebuilding the wall where, or who is leading the rebuilding of the wall where. Uh, remember, you have a map uh, on your table that you can reference if you want to. Um, we remember that this is pointed... Uh, not oriented correctly, it would be more like this, because straight north is out of the top of the Temple Mountain, straight south is out of the Dun Gate. We have circled around the Dun Gate, and we are coming back up um, that eastern side of the wall, right about to where those gardens are at, is where we're going to pick back up today and continue, um, possibly, uh, all the way, the rest of the way around the wall. We'll see what the Lord does here. Um, so we are in verse 18, so remember that in verse 17, uh, we saw that we transitioned to some of the Levites helping because we are coming up on the house of the high priest, and we talked about the importance of having a vision to unify God's people in their efforts, uh, and that is certainly pertinent to us right now as a church as we have just this past Sunday launched our vision for the year uh, in Love Your Neighbor. Um, and that same thing applies to us as applies here. If we can find ourselves unified around that vision, putting our focus and effort into a single place, then we can accomplish great things just as Nehemiah and the people of Jerusalem accomplished great things. So let's look now uh, into verses 18 and 19 as we continue uh, our journey here around the wall. In verse 18... It says, after him, uh, remember that after him or after them is the linking phrase between all of these people, and that follows the pattern of extra biblical literature uh, of surveys of building projects. After him, their brothers repaired. Bavai, the son of Hinnadad, ruler of half the district of Kela, and next to him, Azair, the son of Yeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. So the word buttress here uh, is a word for, it's a Hebrew word for corner, but it is not a corner in the wall. We're going to come up to an actual corner here in a minute, um, but this buttress is a word here that denotes basically a change in direction of the wall. Uh, and that's important, um, as we talked about last week, if you remember, when we were talking about the tomb of David and his mighty men, uh, we talked about the fact that the wall along this section had to be rerouted. So much of the wall up until this point, they were repairing on the foundations that were already there. Um, and we saw some sections where a single group um, repaired a large, long section, and we believe that's because the walls were in different states of disrepair. But when they came around to this west side, at the top of the Kidron Valley, above the Kidron Brook, uh, remember that there had been repeated problems with the structure of the wall there, not just during this time, but all the way back to King David. And so we believe that right here, instead of trying to redo again along this steep slope, that they decided just to reroute the wall. So basically they kind of came into the city a little bit and decided to just build an entirely new section. And the buttress here, and we're going to see that word again in a few minutes, kind of marks where they turned in from the old wall a little bit to make the new wall. These are likely connecting points um, between the rubble um, that we talked about back in um, verse 16. In verse 20, it goes on and it says, After him, Baruch, the son of Zabiah, repaired another section of the buttress to the doors of the house of Eliashab, the high priest. Now, um, we talked about this last week in verse 17 that we were coming up onto um, Eliashab, the uh, high priest at the time. We were coming up onto his house, and that's why the Levites uh, were the ones that were repairing around this section. Remember that the Levites were the one tribe that God had set apart um, to basically be 
the workers in the temple. And this was back when the temple um, was a mobile tent all the way through to where the temple uh, was a built station. The Levites uh, were one of the tribes of Israel that God had put over and in charge of that. And so it made sense that they would be the ones rebuilding around the house of the high priest. Here we also uh, make a couple of other transitions um, that are important um, in indicating that Nehemiah had moved the wall um, from its pre previous location up the hill a little bit. Um, so first we transition from permanent markers to private residents. So at this point we see that now, and we'll see through the next few verses, that all of a sudden instead of referencing gates um, or landmarks, they're referencing people's houses, uh, which lets us know that this wall had to be moved up uh, into the neighborhood, if you will, uh, right there. The second thing that we see also um, is that we are moving from repairing gates to only using them as landmarks. And again, we'll see this over the next couple of verses. Uh, up until this point, when we came to a gate, uh, it would tell us that so-and-so repaired the gate. They rebuilt its walls, they reset its beams, remember all those pieces. Um, at this point though, we're gonna transition to where they're using gates as references. And so they'll say above the gate. Um, and that is again, because we're not along the original wall, we've moved up and inland a little bit. Uh, into the city a little bit. Moving on into verse 21, it says, After Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the doors of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. After him, the priest... Oh, wait, no, sorry, just verse 21. Um, so here we see again uh, Merimoth. So remember we talked about him, um, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, um, but here we see his name repeated again, um, and he is one of a couple of leaders, uh, including the people of the Tekoaites. So remember uh, that the leaders of Tekoa wouldn't come uh, to help rebuild the wall, but their people did come. And we see them again in a minute, and Merimoth here listed as rebuilding a second part of the wall. Uh, and this is a good reminder to us again, like we said, that it wasn't, these leaders weren't the ones there doing the work all by themselves, right? These were leaders that were over um, families, they were over certain guilds, they were over certain sections of the city, they were over certain regions, and they led those people as a whole to come back and repair. And so that's why we see Merimoth here listed uh, as repairing a second section uh, and not just the one section that he started with. So it tells us that he was apparently a leader of a pretty large group uh, of people that would come together. In verse 22 and 23, we continue moving around the wall. And it says, after the priest, the men of the surrounding area repaired. After them, um, Benjamin uh, and Hashub repaired opposite their house. So here we see this phrase, opposite their house. Now again, remember that it's opposite their house because the wall is much closer to their residence because of it being moved. But this shows us one of the ways that the decisions were made as to who repaired what section of the wall. And we're going to see this repeated again in the next couple of chapters as we dive a little bit deeper uh, into the opposition that came against these people. But we can understand that this is a great organizational decision that Nehemiah made for rebuilding the wall. Uh, of course, people working by their own house, uh, number one, they're going to be very close to work, right? Um, and so it's going to be easier for them when they take breaks to go back home for their meals. I mean, just from a practical standpoint, but more importantly, from a motivational standpoint, these people are going to be super committed to something that really matters to them, right? If you're talking about rebuilding a wall around a giant city, what part of the wall do you care most about? the part that's in front of your house, right? Uh, and so as Nehemiah has orchestrated this, um, it's not always the case because again, remember there are lots of people other than those that live in the city that are working on this project. There are people from the region, from other towns that have come in. But in most of the cases where there were people, they were given the responsibility of repairing right in front of their walls because they were gonna be the most motivated about maintaining the safety of their family and their area. Now remember throughout chapter three, we're using this um, rebuilding of the wall, these things that we're learning here as a foreshadowing of the coming of the body of Christ. And so there's so many things in the way that Nehemiah orchestrated these people that we can learn about how we as the body of Christ can come together. And this is another one of those great principles here that we can apply to the body of Christ. This same principle is why it's important for us inside of our volunteer and service in the church to find things that we are 
passionate about. These things obviously must fall uh, under the collective interest and purpose of the church, right? Just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to fall into the scope uh, of what the church needs to be doing, right? The church has a vision, a mission. So like we talked about Sunday that is given to us by Jesus Christ. Not everything falls under that, right? However, there are certain things that will, and when they fall under that, those are places that we should really, really try to pursue, really try to focus on. Um, they should be things that motivate us, right? Those things that we're passionate about are the things that, that motivate us to do things better and harder and longer than we would about things that we didn't care about as much. So if we remember our discussion from earlier, um, a couple of weeks back, Remember that not everything that we do has to necessarily be something that we're passionate about. Remember we talked about that, that sometimes there are things in the body of Christ that just need to be done. And so when we see those, we need to be compelled to step in and to take up that slack because we understand it's best for the body of Christ. But we shouldn't isolate ourselves to just those things. There should be places that we are passionate about serving you know, um, you can think about it as the way that we orchestrate our house, right? There are certain things that you just love about your family life, right? Hanging out with your kids, throwing the football in the backyard with the boys. Listen, I am less than passionate about washing clothes. But here's the reality. Everybody in my house wants to wear clean clothes. Some of the boys might not care as much, but most of the people in my house want to wear clean clothes. That's not something that I'm necessarily passionate about, but it's something that has to be done. But there are things that I am passionate about and about prioritizing with my family. And again, it's the same thing in the body of Christ. There may be some things that you look at and you go, you know what, I'm going to do that because I see that it needs to be done right now. But there should be something for every single one of us. There should be some place for every one of us that we are serving inside the body of Christ that we are passionate about. Something that if somebody came and tried to change it or take it away, we would fight for it because we care about it that much. Here's the application question. Are there things that you are doing in the church right now that you are passionate about? What are they? The application point makes it a little bit easier. Make a list of some of the things that you are passionate about. Now, that seems like an easy question, but once you sit down and actually try to do it, sometimes it's a little more difficult than um, is first apparent. But here's some things you can think about. Think about the things that make you the most happy. What are the things that bring you the most joy in life? Those are probably things that you're really passionate about. Think about the things that make you the most angry. When you see an injustice done, the thing that frustrates you the most about it, sometimes those are the things that you are most passionate about. The things that brings tears to our eyes. Those things that we're passionate about are typically the things that push us to the extremes of our emotion. We care about them the most. When they don't happen, we, we grieve about them the most. When they're done wrong, it angers us the most. Those are the things often that we are most passionate about. The things that pique our interest, right? Every time we hear them, we always stop to listen if somebody's talking about if you're, if you're passionate about foreign missions, right? Every time somebody says something about that, you're always going to stop, right? Because you want to hear about what that is. Those things that pique your interest. So make a list of about three or four things that you are passionate about. And then beside each one of them, write one or two ways that you could pursue that passion within the body of Christ. Moving on in verse 24 and 25. Verse 24 says, After him, Benunai, the son of Hinnadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Palal, the son of Uzziah, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. And after him, Pedadiah, the son of Parash. So here in verse 24 and 25, um, we actually do come to a corner. Um, so again, remember we were talking about the buttresses, and the buttresses were the two places where they kind of rerouted the wall. Um, now we have come to an actual corner. You can see it on your map. Um, it's listed right beside the water gate, right above those gardens. So this is a corner of the wall um, where we actually do turn a corner. We turn a 90 degree, um, and it is headed up to 
the part of the, the residential part of the city that bulges out um, below the Temple Mount. And so here this corner is an actual corner. And we'll talk about that section, uh, that residential section called the Ophel here in just a second. We'll come to it uh, in just a couple of verses. In verse 26, moving on, <clears throat> it says, And the temple servants living on Ophel repair to a point opposite the water gate on the east and to the projecting tower. So here uh, again, we see this next verse in this term that we've talked about opposite that we talked about earlier. Um, and this again is because we've had to move slightly um, some of these gates around. Uh, and so they're not repairing necessarily the same one, but it's used as a landmark. Uh, and then, like I said, here we're talking about the Ophel, um, which was the beginning of the Temple Hill. Um, and so the Temple Mount, again, remember that the whole city of Jerusalem sits on a ridge and the temple sits at the top of that ridge. And so the Temple Mount is basically, not exactly, but it's pretty much uh, a box, a square there at the top. And so the first part of the residential city, and again, this part, remember this original part, is called the city of David because David is the one that repaired it and rebuilt it, um, came out almost parallel to those other walls. And so you almost get kind of a little box below the box before the wall had to start meandering down kind of that finger point down at the dung gate. So the oval was the beginning of this temple hill and it was typically the residential section um, for those that worked in the temple. So all of the temple workers, uh, obviously nobody, well not nobody, the high priest and some were, um, but the temple workers, a lot of the Levites, didn't live inside the temple, but they wanted to live close to the temple so that they could do all their duties. Um, and so it was very typical for this area to be mostly inhabited by temple workers. So obviously then, again, back to our principle, it makes the most sense that these temple servants would be the ones that were living here and then therefore that they would be repairing here. Verse 27 through 30, 27 says, after him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tap projecting tower as far as the wall of the Ophel. So again, remember, this is the second time that we've seen the Tekoaites, um, just like uh, Merimoth, they are repairing multiple sections of the wall. 29 says, uh, above the horse gate, the priest repaired, um, each one opposite his own house. And again, we've already talked about um, the importance of that. Uh, after them, Zadok, the son of Emir, repaired opposite his own house. And after him, Shemaiah, the son of Shekaniah, uh, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. And after him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hunan, the sixth son of Zalapheth, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, repaired opposite his chamber. So now this is the second time that we've seen um, this name, Meshulam, there in the last verse. Um, the other one was back in verse 4. Remember we talked about him being present. Um, he was a good linking character back to the ministry of Ezra. Uh, but this is a different one, obviously because of where he's at, also because of his heritage. Um, but he is also an interesting character in the wider scope of the story that is to come, so to speak. Um, so this is more than likely, from what we can tell, this is probably the man um, who married the daughter of Tobiah the Ammonite. So remember that um, we're about to get into a lot of opposition in chapter 4. We've already seen a little bit of the rumblings, so to speak, as soon as Nehemiah came into town, uh, and those came uh, from a couple of people. One of them was Tobiah. Well, Tobiah had a daughter, uh, and that daughter married uh, this Meshulam. We can, we'll see that coming up uh, in chapter 6, around verse 18. Uh, and so because of this, that means Tobiah would have been then related to the priest Eliashib, the high priest. We already talked about his house. And so that would have given him a familial connection back to the high priest uh, through this liaison. And so therefore, Tobiah would have been able to obtain a chamber in the temple complex, which he will in chapters 13. So we'll kind of reference back when we get there. But when we get to chapter 13, it's like, well, gracious, why does this enemy of Nehemiah, why is he living in the temple? Here's that connection backtrack. And so again, we'll reference him when we get there. But we want to talk about it right here, basically just kind of lay that foundation uh, for stuff that is to come. So then 31 and 32, and it says, After him, Melchiajah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate, and to the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. So here again, we're seeing... Um, 
two of several guilds that we've kind of already seen throughout the area. And it's a reminder that there were lots of different ways that these people were being organized. And here we also find ourselves back full circle all the way around to the Sheep Gate. So remember the Sheep Gate is that northernmost gate out of the top of the Temple Mount. That's where we started. Remember that the priests started um, building that gate and they consecrated that gate. And then we came counterclockwise all the way around the city. And now we are back to the very beginning. And so now we have been given kind of the full layout of who's repairing what sections around the wall. So let's back out a little bit and consider kind of in conclusion of chapter three and think about some of the things that we've talked about repeatedly. Um, British humorist uh, Jerome, Jerome, Jerome K. Jerome, his first and last name was Jerome, that's right. Um, he once quoted, I really like work. It fascinates me. I can sit and watch it for hours. But Christian Warren Weber goes on from that comment and he says, but when it comes to the work of the Lord, there is no place for spectators. There is no place for self-appointed advisors. There is no place for critics, but there is always room for workers. We're reminded in our place here in the body of Christ that we are called to work for the kingdom. There's so many things that a church, a local church needs to be about. There's so many things that we need to be doing to reach our community, to push back lostness in our area, to affect lostness around the world, to disciple our people, to raise up our children. There's so many things that we need to be about, so many things that God has commanded us to do. And he has called us all together so that we can do it together. There's no place for spectators in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how recently you've come into the church. It doesn't matter how long you've been serving in the church. There is a place for you. I got to go visit um, yesterday uh, an older lady um, who is definitely in the winter season of her life. Um, and she said, I'm not sure why God still has me here, but I know there's a reason for it. What a great testimony of realizing that she understood that God has put her here to be about his business. And even in her frailty, all of her, her she's homebound in her condition. She still is looking and saying, I am here because God has something for me to do. Listen, brothers and sisters, no matter what church you're in, but especially for all of you that are a part of North Conway, God has you here to be about his business. He has something for you to do that you and only you are uniquely equipped and called to do that if you don't do it, we will be a weaker church for it. But as we all rise up to build, as we all rise up to do the things that he's called us to do, as we all get our hands dirty in the work, so we will begin to accomplish so much more than any one of us could have ever accomplished by themselves. That's really the key idea of this whole chapter, this chapter three, is that we are in this together. They were in it together to accomplish what God had called them to do. We as a church gathered together are in this together for what God has called us to do. Listen, the power of God's people coming together is something that we should never underestimate. But it is something that is underscored by the fact here that Nehemiah, this great leader, is nowhere mentioned in chapter 3. Remember, there's a Nehemiah that we talked about, but it's not our Nehemiah. And the very fact that he's not mentioned here underscores the importance of God's people coming together. He didn't make it all about him. He wanted to list here these people that were working as if he's trying to say to us, this is not about me. This is about these people and their willingness to build now, we're sure, obviously, that he had a large part to play uh, because something of this magnitude, something of this level of organization and administration didn't just accidentally happen, right? Yet, even when we have sections that we're pretty sure were from his personal diaries, remember we talked about this in the introduction, that this is compiled from some of uh, his personal diaries as well as some of the things that were written back to the library of the king, even in the places where we're pretty sure it's his personal diary, he never talks about himself. He directs all of the highlights, all of the emphasis back onto the people. And eventually in chapter 6, he's going to culminate by giving all of the glory back to God when he says the work has been accomplished with the help of our God. 
Think about the contrast of that to Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was leader of the Babylonians that came in and, and caused all this mess, right? He's the one that came in and tore down the wall. Uh, he built up a great kingdom. Uh, in fact, at the time, it was the largest kingdom that had ever ruled across the planet. But in Daniel 4, this is what he says. He says, the king answered, this is him, is not this great Babylon which I have built by my own might and power as a royal residence for the glory of my own majesty. Compare that to Nehemiah, right? We have a leader that looked around and said, I did this by the sheer power of my will. And then we have a leader that said, don't look at me. Look at these people who have gathered together for the purpose of accomplish, accomplishing this mighty task that he has put before us. Brothers and sisters, that is what we need to be. We need to be gathered together under a single purpose, and that purpose is advancing the gospel. It's the mission that he gave us at the Great Commission, that we should go and make disciples, baptizing, teaching. That is the mission. That is the purpose, the greater purpose that God has given us. And we should be gathered together, each one with our place around the wall of the church, around the purpose and mission that we have, working together towards that common goal, working in different places, working in different ways, but all working together to accomplish that mighty work. So that is the end of chapter three. I know that's like breakneck speed, right? We were only in this chapter for like four weeks. It's crazy. Um, but so now we're going to turn our attention into chapter four. Um, so chapter four, just as way of introduction, we won't be able to get really into the verses, but just to lay some foundation as way of introduction. So the next several chapters are all about this rebuilding work. So chapter three was all about the who's who of building around it, right? Um, basically, we've been given a survey of this rebuilding project. Uh, we've put all the pieces on the playing board, so to speak. But chapter four, five, and half of six get into the game as it is being played out. And it is not an easy game. Uh, this is all the people and where they were working, um, but we don't want to understand from this chapter that it was all just breezy work, right? They just came in and boom, they worked and it was done. No, chapters four, five, and, the, and five, four, five, and half of six um, are going to lay out the opposition that came against Nehemiah and his people, and it's going to come in three sections. We're going to start by seeing some opposition that came from outside um, Tobias and Balat, these guys again, and then we're going to see a section uh, in chapter five of opposition that came from inside of God's own people in Jerusalem. And then we're going to conclude again with some more opposition that came from the outside. Now, obviously, we've read the whole story, right? And we know that that opposition doesn't stop what God is doing, and that's important for us to keep in mind. But we can learn several lessons by watching how Nehemiah dealt with these oppositions. And that's exactly what we're going to do um, throughout this chapter four because Nehemiah is going to share uh, in detail um, how they pushed back this opposition and didn't allow it to break down their work. Listen, it's an axiom of life, and here you can count on it. You can write it down. When God's people attempt to do God's work in God's way, there will always come opposition. When God's people attempt to do God's work in God's way, there will always always come opposition. Listen, you can look throughout scripture, you can look throughout history. It doesn't take but a quick survey to realize that when God is trying to do something incredible, God's enemies are going to come against his people to try to stop that or and are to try to stop God from receiving the glory for whatever that is. An axiom is something that you can just you can count on, right? You can count it as as written in stone. No matter what happens, you can believe it's always going to be true. And this is one of those things. And it takes all three of those. When God's people, right, are trying to be about God's business in God's way. So we are responsible for number one, being engaged. It takes all of us coming around, coming around his mission, his purpose, his vision for us. The second is to be about his work. We are not here to build our own kingdom. We are not here to build our own glory. We are not here to do things that celebrate us. We are here to do God's work. But thirdly, it has to be in his way. Listen, we could come together as his people, the church. 
And we can say that we understand that God wants us to grow his church, right? So that would be God's people. That would be God's work. And then we can go off on our own and we can try to do that in so many ridiculous ways. If you don't believe it, just do a Google search on the internet. How many churches have grown up to, especially in the last couple of decades in the, in the era of the megachurch, that have grown up to be these huge thousands and ten thousands of people, and yet they do it by perverting the gospel. They do it by tickling people's ears. They do it by offering what they want to hear and not giving them what God's word says. And so they are God's people trying to accomplish God's task, but they are doing it in a completely wrong way. God's opposite, the, nothing's going to oppose that. Why would it? It speaks for itself. But when God's people are about his work in his way, we know opposition is going to come. And so we can count on that. And so we'll pick up right there um, next week as we continue into chapter four and actually start to get into the heart of some of this opposition. Let me close this in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time that we have together. We thank you uh, for completing chapter three today, God. Father, we thank you for the great testimony to us as the body of Christ that we can see portrayed in these people coming together around the wall, God. Your people coming together for your purpose, just as we understand that we now, as the church, are your people drawn together for your purpose. And so, Father, may we be about your business in your way every single day. Father, as we turn our attention now to the opposition that's going to come in chapter 4, help that to speak to us in our life and how we should face antagonism to your ministry when we face it because we are trying to do your will. Father, we pray that you bring us back each one next week into this place so that we continue to feast upon your word. And God, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 